how great thou art. He is a great God. Tonight our topic is amazing discoveries in the lost cities of the dead. Come with me tonight on a journey, a journey to the ancient Middle East. Our journey begins in Jerusalem. I've traveled to Jerusalem in the Middle East on numerous occasions. And you can travel to Jerusalem only once before it wins your heart. Jerusalem is that city that is kind of like the mother city of all humanity. When you arrive at Jerusalem, it's like arriving home, traveling to Jerusalem. You travel through many, you can enter the city through many gates. My favorite place to go is through the Damascus Gate. Jerusalem is broken up into four quarters. There is the Christian quarter, the Muslim quarter. There is the Armenian quarter and the Jewish quarter. But when you get through the Damascus Gate, you're going into the Muslim quarter of the city. And the Damascus Gate is really teeming with activity. It's really exciting. You go through there at the time of Muslim prayer and you're often carried away in the crowd. I remember one time I had a group of four or five tourists with me, and oh, it was actually a large tourist group, a couple hundred, but I took four or five of them at the uh, time of prayer down to the Damascus Gate just to experience the crush of the crowd. I remember I had a man who had never been there before, and we're going through the Damascus Gate. It's the time of Muslim prayer, and the crowd came through and really literally picked us up, and we're being carried along with the crowd. And this fellow got so frightened, I had to actually go back and carry him out. But the Damascus Gate is really is an exciting place to be. Right outside the gate, some of the most beautiful fruits and vegetables in all the world. When you go through the Damascus Gate, you go into a number of shops. And as you walk through that gate and come to those shops, you have teeming multitudes of people. Beginning to haggle with the Arab traders is really a lot of fun. Any Arab worth his weight in salt does not want to sell you the carpet that he offers you for that carpet for at the price that he offers it for. I mean, if he offers it to you for $500 and you pay $500, he goes home really disappointed because part of the process in Arab culture is to haggle. You start at about 50% of the price and then you work your way up a little bit from there. Walking through the streets, you may see people dressed in Arab dress in Jerusalem. They may be more modern dress and jeans that have been influenced by Western culture. You walk down those narrow alleyways. You may walk aside a old Jewish man that's on his way to the Western Wall to pray. When you look at Jerusalem, Jerusalem really is the center of three great world religions. It's the center of Judaism, the center of Islam, and the center of Christianity. Jerusalem is famous in Judaism. It's renowned in Judaism because it was the center, of course, of the temple, Herod's temple. And the Western Wall is the holiest shrine of the Jewish world. As you understand this history tonight, you're going to understand much more what's really going on in the Middle East. What is this Western Wall? Why is it so significant to the Jews? And why is it the holiest shrine in the Jewish world? It's the portion of the wall that Herod built around the second temple in 20 BC. See, there were two great temples, the temple that Solomon built about a thousand years before Christ and the temple that was built by Herod shortly before the days of Jesus. This temple built by Herod was a masterpiece of architecture and it was the place of Jewish worship. In 70 AD, Titus, the Roman soldier, and with his armies destroyed the temple. The only thing that is left is the western wall of that temple. So when the Jews go there today to pray at that western wall, they go praying that the glory of Israel will return, that the predominance and prevalence of Israel and the state of Israel will return, that Israel's enemies will be defeated. Every child coming to the wall comes, if he's an Israeli child, comes at the time of 12 at his bar mitzvah, comes to that wall to pray, to pray for the glory of Israel. Now you'll notice in this graphic that in the cracks of the wall there are pieces of paper. These are prayers. And so these prayers are inserted in the wall, 
prayers that Israel would retain the glory of its Old Testament period of time. So the Western Wall is a significant point of Israeli history. Now the Dome of the Rock is built on Mount Moriah. It's the former site of the Jewish Temple complex. The Dome of the Rock is just above the Western Wall. So you can imagine it. Our Israeli Jewish friends come to pray at the Western Wall. But they look above that, they see on the site of their previous holiest site, the temple, where you had the Shekinah glory of God manifest, they see now a Muslim mosque on that site. So it's a source of constant irritation for those Jews. The Dome of the Rock was built at the end of the 7th century. It was built on the spot where our Muslim friends believe that Mohammed ascended to heaven. That's right. They believe that from this spot Mohammed ascended to heaven on a white steed, incidentally. It took all the taxes of the Caliph's province in Egypt seven years to finance the building. And I can assure you, I've walked around the building, I've been in the building. It is incredibly magnificent. You take a noonday in, in Jerusalem with the sun dancing off those blue glazed tiles and uh, dancing off, is shimmering off that golden roof. You may be across the valley, the Kidron Valley on the uh, Mount of Olives, and you look across and you see the sun just shimmering off this temple. It's spectacular. One of the most spectacular buildings in all the world. This is a shot inside the temple. Uh, and this is the rock that Abraham offered Isaac on, or was to offer Isaac, when he saw the ram in the thicket. Both the Jews and the Muslims trace their lineage back to Abraham. Jews believe that Isaac was the child of promise. The uh, Muslims believe that Ishmael was the child of promise. And so you see that conflict here. You see Jews looking to this temple site, believing that their temple should be on this site. They see Arabs going to the site that they once worshipped on, and for them, this is defiling. For the Arabs, any Jew that puts his footstep on this site indeed would be defiling as well. But Jerusalem is not simply a site that's sacred to the Muslims or the Jews. It's a site that's sacred to the Christians. Here was the way of the cross. Here are the streets that Jesus walked through with that heavy wooden cross on his shoulders, bleeding from his temples, with the blood dripping on this Via Della Rosa, the way of the cross. Jerusalem is sacred, sacred to the Muslims, sacred to the Jews. Jerusalem is sacred, sacred to the Christians. But Jerusalem, the city of peace, has become the center of conflict. Down through the ages, this city, has become a real center of conflict through the millennia. Jerusalem has been attacked by the Babylonians, by the Assyrians, by the Egyptians, by the Romans, by the Turks, and a host of others. Jerusalem. See, Salem is peace. Jerusalem, city of peace. But it's not been a city of peace. It's been a city of war. And the question is, will we see World War III break out in Jerusalem? The question is, what is the ultimate fate of Jerusalem? Today, the streets of Jerusalem are quite tense. I used to feel very comfortable in taking large tourist groups there. I'd taken them to other places in the Middle East today. But I will take smaller groups there today. I'm a little concerned about taking large groups there. You, re you go back and here's a bus that was exploded in a recent terrorist attack. A terrorist came onto the bus with explosives laden in a vest underneath his shirt blew himself apart, body parts went everywhere, blood spattered on the walls of buildings. So it's a little more dangerous today with the terrorist attacks in Jerusalem than it was a number of years ago. USA Today reported on a driver, an Arab driver, that rammed a bulldozer into a Jerusalem bus. Three were dead and dozens were hurt. The streets of Jerusalem are tense today. Streets of Jerusalem are filled with anxiety and worry today. And we look out of the windows of our homes. And we have questions in our hearts, questions in our minds. The future appears very insecure. You look at the American dollar and what's happening here. 
You look at the banks that have gone belly up and bankrupt. You look at the foreclosures you, of, of homes. You look at the sagging economy, the layoff of jobs. You look at the trouble in the Middle East. And many leading people are thinking and they're wondering what indeed does the future hold. Many people believe the conflict in the Middle East will erupt into a global battle. They're convinced that the Arab-Israeli conflict will explode into World War III. What does the future hold? Where can we find reliable information about the future? Where can we find something to hold on to? How can we face the future with much greater confidence? The Washington Post, February 23, 2003, talked about the Middle East. And it talked about America's attack on Iraq. And it said, world destabilizing aggression could spin out of control and lead to other despots arming themselves with all manner of apocalyptic weapons, apocalyptic means last day, and perhaps to Armageddon. Now the Washington Post, ladies and gentlemen, is not known as a newspaper that is a religious paper. This is no religious journal, it's a secular journal. But yet it uses that biblical word Armageddon. And it talks about the world situation spinning out of control. The world situation that nobody can possibly get under hand, under tow. And it talks about the possibility of apocalyptic weapons and perhaps to Armageddon. What does the future hold? All around the world, thinking men and women are asking questions. Questions like, what does the future hold? Questions like, what's next? Questions like, where is this world headed? Have you asked those questions yourself? Have you been wondering, what's really going on in this world? Where is this world headed? Where can I find confidence? What can I rely on? What won't let me down in a crisis? I want you to come with me tonight on a journey to the fascinating lands of the Middle East and discover the reliability of an ancient book. I want you to come with me tonight on a journey. We're not on a tourist journey. We're not tourists at a travelogue simply looking at the monuments of the Middle East. But we're going to pass by a lot of the popular tourist sites tonight. We're going to travel to Egypt. We're going to travel to Israel. We're going to travel to Lebanon. We're going to travel tonight to Jordan. But we're on a journey with a purpose. We're looking to discover tonight where we can find confidence. Confidence in understanding the future. So come with me tonight as we begin our journey. Fulfilled Bible prophecy verifies the truthfulness of God's Word. We're going to look at some amazing prophecies and some amazing archaeological finds. Fulfilled Bible prophecy verifies the truthfulness of God's Word. It gives us confidence that the future is not in the hands of man, but the future is really in the hands of God. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10. Read it together with me wherever you are tonight. Read it with me. You may be watching in Washington, D.C. tonight. You may be watching, watching in California tonight or in some place in Canada tonight, Montana, Michigan tonight, wherever you are. Let's read it together. Orlando, let's read. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Now, why is it that there's nobody else like God? What quality does God have that no one else has? Let's read it together. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. What quality does God have that no one else has? He can do what? He can declare the what? End from the beginning and he can show from ancient times things that are not yet done. Tonight, we're going to journey. We're going to journey to the heart of the Middle East. We're going to see prophecies made centuries ago coming that have been fulfilled already. You see, tonight is a background for a whole series. Before this series is over, I'm going to take you into prophecies of the future. Prophecies that talk about the United States. Prophecies that talk about the future of Europe. Prophecies that talk about the future of the world. But first I want to show you that the prophecies made in the past have come true. 
And if the prophecies made in the past have come true, if we can have confidence in that ancient book called the Bible about what has already happened, then we can have confidence about what's going to happen in the future. So he's the God that declares the end from the beginning, from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. We travel tonight to begin in the land of Egypt, the magnificent land of the Nile. You, I love Egypt. You travel past the pyramids. They're just, the pyramids are, are just fascinating. They're imposing. Egypt is the land of fascinating pyramids. Egypt is the land of fantastic treasures. You look at the detail on this chair found in King Tutankhamun's tomb, brazen gold and, and carefully etched animal figures on the arms. Egypt is a land of fantastic treasures. Egypt is also a land of awesome monuments. You stand at these magnificent monuments of Egypt. They are absolutely incredible. Egypt is a land of ancient temples. And Egypt is a land of really magnificent culture. When you look at the culture of Egypt, you see that Egypt was far in advance in the area of mathematics, science, architecture, engineering, design. The pyramids really indicate that. The pyramids at Giza required 2.5 million blocks of stone. I mean, just absolutely incredible stuff. The Great Pyramid Cheops at Giza towers over 480 feet and it spreads over 13 acres. Now let's get a perspective of that. I've got a, do I have any builders here? I know there must be some builder out in Michigan watching. Must be some builder over in Rhode Island or Connecticut watching, but I got some builders in Orlando. How high is a story? How high is one story? How many feet? About 10, 12 feet, right? So let's say 10. So if you got one story 10 feet, you've got 48 stories is, is, is the height of the Cheops Pyramid in Egypt. 48 stories. Do we have any buildings in Orlando that are 48 stories? What's the highest building in Orlando? How many stories? Well, let's say it's uh, 35 stories. I don't know. 30 stories? I thought this was a big-time city. <laughs> anyway, we got one of these little buildings, 12 stories, okay? The next time you are downtown, wherever you are, stand and look at that building. Somebody's going to come by and say, what in the world are you doing? And you know what you're going to say? You're going to say, oh, I'm just kind of measuring and trying to figure out how high the great pyramid Cheops is. Well, anyway, 48 stories tall. It's amazing to look at that. It takes your breath away. Some of the blocks weighed 1.5 to 3 tons each. And they lifted them 48 stories. You talk about engineering. That is fantastic. When my friend Dr. Michael Hassel is here, and Dr. Hassel will be here in a week, he is one of the leading Egyptologists in the world. He will bring artifacts, and we're going to quiz Dr. Hassel at how they got those bricks up that high. When National Geographic did its special on Egypt, they invited Dr. Hassel to be with them to do some of the Egypt portions, and we're going to ask him how they got those brick, ton, those, those blocks so high. Do you know it took to build the great pyramids in Giza? It took 120,000 slaves 20 years to build the pyramids. 120,000 workmen. But wait a minute. We have to go deeper into Egypt. We need to go by the pyramids. We go down to the Valley of the Kings. Here is where King Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered. Magnificent discovery of this boy king's tomb. Howard Carter, early 1920s, discovered the face of the boy king. But we need to go past the awesome monuments. We need to go past the great columns and the pillars. We need to go past the pyramids. We need to go past the Valley of the Kings because we're on a journey of discovery. We want to come to a small place, a place that Napoleon's armies invaded in Egypt, a place called Rosetta. When Napoleon invaded Egypt, he brought with him 100 scientists. And as they were digging in a place called Rosetta, they discovered the Rosetta Stone. Now up until this time, nobody could understand the hieroglyphics of Egypt, that picture language. 
the Rosetta Stone was written really in three languages. It's housed in the British Museum today. The top language is hieroglyphics, the picture language of Egypt. The middle language is a language we call demotic. That's not demonic. It has nothing to do with demons. It is a written language called demotic of the Egyptians. Nobody understood the hieroglyphics. A few people may have understood some words in demotic, but almost none. But here's the significant thing. The bottom thing of this stone was written in Greek. Wait a minute now. If you can understand the Greek and you can extrapolate, you might be able to understand the hieroglyphics. A brilliant Frenchman by the name of John Francis Champion began to work on it and he understood the Greek, he deciphered the hieroglyphics, so now the hieroglyphics began to talk to us. And they began to share with us the ancient background of the biblical story. Let me give you an example. In the Bible, it talks about a mighty nation a nation called the Hittites, a nation of thousands of warriors that fought against the Egyptians. But up until the time we understood the hieroglyphics, the critics of the Bible, the scholars, many intellectuals said the Bible is a book of fairy tales and myths because the Bible talks about the Hittites warring against the Egyptians. There is no such people at all. They never existed. That's a big myth of the Bible. But when the Rosetta Stone was discovered and the mystery of the hieroglyphics was unlocked, the hieroglyphics tell about Ramses II of Egypt battling against the Hittites. Today, the archaeologists have uncovered the Hittite kingdom and the mouth of the skeptics has been stopped because that which the Bible says can be verified. This past summer, my wife and I and a small group of us flew to Istanbul just a few months ago. Then we flew to Ankara, the capital of Turkey, and then we went on to way out in the countryside, far out in the barren lands. We were on a journey of discovery. I wanted new pictures. And we came to the Hittite capital, and these people, these are the ruins of the Hittite capital. This capital had thousands and thousands of soldiers. And we went there through the very famous Lion Gate. This picture was taken just a few months ago when we were at the Hittite capital because the Bible talks about the battle between the Hittites and the battle between the Egyptians. And the scholars said the Hittites never existed. And we said we must go out and photograph that for our audiences so they can see with their eyes that what the Bible says is true. Here is a peace treaty that the archaeologists have uncovered. The rocks are crying out today. The rocks are speaking today. Look at this peace treaty. It's a peace treaty between Ramses II of Egypt and Hattusheli III of the Hittites following the battle of Kadesh. We have the peace treaty between the two groups today. That which people said did not exist is verified in history today. You can have confidence in this book, my friend. It is clearly the Bible is clearly the word of the living God. But whatever happened to the splendor? Whatever happened to the wealth? Whatever happened to the magnificence of Egypt? Let me show you some absolutely amazing Bible prophecies. For 500 years, Memphis was the capital of Egypt. Now, I know that some of you thought Memphis was in Tennessee. <laughs> Memphis was the capital of Egypt for a number of years. Memphis, Tennessee, of course, takes its title and name from the uh, great capital of Egypt. What Memphis was known for was really idolatry. Memphis was the center of idolatry. It had thousands and thousands and thousands of idols there, worship of false gods, worship of pagan gods. Here's what the Bible said, Ezekiel 30, verse 13. Let's read it together. Thus says the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols and cause the images to see from not. Now, Naf is another name for Memphis. It's uh, the uh, Hebrew name for Memphis. So here God says, I'm going to destroy all, all the idols of Memphis, this great, magnificent capital city of Egypt. And he says all the images are going to cease from Naf or from Memphis. Travel with me to Memphis today. All you see is weeds growing up 
and broken down idols. God's word has been fulfilled exactly. That prophecy has been fulfilled. Here is Amelia Edwards, an Egyptologist. Here's what she says. Where are the stately ruins? Which even in the Middle Ages extended over the space of half a day's journey in each direction. One can hardly believe that a great city flourished on this spot or understand how it should have been effaced, that means destroyed, so completely. You see what this Egyptologist is saying? She's saying, look, I'm standing at, at Memphis, this fantastic city, and I look at its ruins, and I say, how could this city have been destroyed so completely? It's gone. Why was it destroyed so completely? Because it was an idol-worshiping city, and God's word said that it would be destroyed. What about the history of Egypt? Ezekiel 32, verse 12. Ezekiel was a prophet who lived at the time of Daniel, 600 years before Christ. He said, by the swords of the mighty warriors, all of them the most terrible of the nations, I will cause your multitude to fall. They shall plunder the pomp. Another name for a pomp is wealth. They shall plunder the wealth of Egypt, and all its multitude shall be destroyed. The Bible says the wealth of Egypt would be plundered. What happened? Down through the centuries, the grave robbers came and they robbed the gold of Egypt, exactly like the Bible said. You see, the Bible does not guess it knows. This is not a human book, it is a divine book. The temples of Egypt have been plundered exactly like the Bible predicted. The Bible goes on in its prophecies about Egypt and the Bible says in Ezekiel 32 verse 15, when I make the land of Egypt, what everybody? desolate, and the country is destitute of all that once fulfilled it. If you look at the ancient times, the River Nile flowed through the uh, city of, e of the nation of Egypt. It was very fertile. Now the Bible says, and of course it had desert back then, but today it is desolate. It's destitute, exactly like the Bible predicted. As we wander around through the broken down ruins of Egypt, as we see this magnificent culture that was once so wealthy, as we see its temples plundered, as we see its magnificence gone, as we see the splendor of an ancient civilization that has evaporated like grains of sand slipping through the fingers, as we see that, as we see the prophecies of the Bible, on our journey of discovery, we say to ourselves, we can have confidence in this book. What it said about the past is going to be fulfilled in the future. The Bible is more than a common book. It's a book inspired by the living God. Just as the Bible predicted, Egypt is a barren land and the dynasties of the past are lost in the wind-swept sands of the desert. But we're on a journey of discovery. Let's travel from Egypt. These ancient predictions from the scriptures are extremely specific. They reveal the future of empire, cities, and rulers. Let's go up into Israel. We'll leave Egypt, go across the border, go into the southern half of the Sinai Desert Peninsula in, Egypt, in, in Israel. We'll travel northward. We'll make a stop in the desert. There's something in the desert I want us to see. I know it's a little hot, but if you have a good hat on, you got some sunscreen on, I think you're going to be okay on our journey tonight. So, I really want to make this stop in the desert. It won't be a long stop. It's not far from Beersheba, the home of Abraham. This is in southern Israel, of course. It was here, about 24 miles north of Beersheba, that there's a statement that's really fascinating. You see, the Israeli prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, predicted that Nebuchadnezzar, who was the Babylonian king, would attack Jerusalem. So these prophets in Israel said, Jerusalem is going to be attacked. And it's going to be attacked by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, here's something fascinating. 24 miles north of Beersheba, we see verification of the fulfillment of that prophecy. Jeremiah 32, verse 29. Here's the prophecy. In the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, who fight against this city, Jerusalem, shall come and set fire to this city and burn it. So here, Jeremiah predicted that the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar would attack Jerusalem. They would come to the city and they would burn it down. Now let's look at the discovery that was made by the archaeologists that reveal the truthfulness of this prophecy. Here is the discovery. 
It's a discovery called the Lakish Letters. Now, these letters were not written on paper. They would be written either on parchment or stone. This was, these letters were discovered from 1932 to 1938. They were discovered in a discovery 24 miles north of Beersheba. These letters describe the actual attack of Nebuchadnezzar on Jerusalem in 580. 587 BC. Now here's the point. You can read about the attack of Nebuchadnezzar on Jerusalem in the Bible, but you don't need the Bible to understand that attack. You can take out the rock records and read the same thing because the Bible is confirmed in these rock records. Now here's what's impressive to me. What is significantly impressive is this. So many of these discoveries are being made recently. So many of these discoveries are made in the 20th and 21st century. It seems as if God is saying to this generation, you know, we live in a generation that says, show me. We live in a generation that says, prove it to me. We live in a generation that says, seeing is what? Believing. believing. God said, okay, you want evidence? I'm going to give you evidence to believe. I'm going to give evidence for the inquiring mind to believe. We need to travel from the south of Israel to the north of Israel. You're going to like the north a little better because it's not quite as hot the gentle breezes are blowing in off the Sea of Galilee. It's, you can see Mount Hermon with its snow-capped mount in the, in the little distance. One of the most significant recent discoveries that confirms the history of Israel and the reign of King David was unearthed in Tel Dan in northern Israel. Now, up until this time, we had no evidence outside the Bible that David existed. So there were those people that said, David, king of Israel, is a myth like King Arthur of the round table with his knights of the round table in England. That's just a big myth. So they said, there's no historical record of King David. He probably didn't exist. The Israeli archaeologists were digging up at this place in northern Israel. Now, this happened in 1993. It confirms 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. 1 Samuel 16, verse 13 says, Samuel took the horn of oil anointed him, that's David, in the midst of his brothers. And then it goes on to say, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. So here's the biblical account. Samuel anoints David with oil as king of Israel. Look at this. This is amazing. Here at Tel Dan, northern Israel, the archaeologists are doing some uncovering not expecting to come across what they came across. But as they were doing the uncovering, they discovered a rock record right from the time of David that talks about David as the king of Israel. Here is the David Stella. You're looking at it with your own eyes. It describes David. It describes king of Israel. This find was so remarkable. This find was so significant that it made the front page of the New York Times. The New York Times isn't necessarily a religious newspaper. But yet it printed an article verifying the truthfulness of the Bible. Here's biblical archaeological review. Here's what the scholars said in 1993. A dramatic find confirmed the historicity of David, king of Israel. A team of archaeologists digging in northern Galilee found a remarkable inscription from the 9th century BC that refers both to the house of David and to the king of Israel David found at Dan. An inscription so magnificent, so significant, so sensational that indeed this discovery made the front page of the New York Times. It shows Israel and Judah were important kingdoms in the 9th century BC. What's God saying to you and me? He's saying there's evidence to believe. He's saying you can trust his word. He's saying that as you read his word, you're going to discover peace. You're going to discover security. You're going to discover a joy in your life that you cannot now imagine. He's saying that his word is an adequate guide of the past, the present, and the future. Let's go to Jordan. We were guests of the Jordanian government, and I was flown on Royal Jordanian Airlines to Jordan to do a series of television programs in a place called Petra. But one of the interesting discoveries, and incidentally, one night I'm going to take you to Petra, the Moabite stone was discovered in 1868 in Jordan. And it confirms what the Bible says in 2 Kings 1 and 2 Kings 3. 
The Bible talks about a group called the Moabites. Now remember, the Moabites were a pagan tribe that worshipped idols that attacked Israel. And there was a German missionary by the name of F.A. Klein, and he was doing some uh, hiking. And 20 miles east of the Dead Sea in Jordan, he came across this stone. He didn't know what it was at first. But the amazing thing about the stone is this. In 2 Kings 3, verse 18, it says, This is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites into your hand. So the Moabites, a pagan tribe, would be delivered into Israel's hand. There are people that say, look, that never happened. But then, 20th century, what happens? The discovery of archaeological artifacts that show the truthfulness of God's word. The Moabites indeed did attack Israel, and Israel defeated them. Look at this prophecy. Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1, it says, In the year that Tartan came to Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and he fought against Ashdod and took it. Now, he, Sargon was the king of what, what nation? What does it say? King of what? Assyria. But if you look at all the king's lists, Sargon's name was not there. And so many, many scholars said, you know what? Sargon never was the king of Assyria. We don't see his name there. The Bible's a bunch of myths. Then Paul Bota, a Frenchman, was digging in a place called Corsabad in Syria. And as he was digging, he uncovered a palace. And whose palace do you think it was? Sargon's. A friend of mine put it this way. The absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. The absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. In other words, merely because we haven't discovered something yet doesn't mean that the thing we haven't discovered doesn't exist. The, the critics open their mouth and they seem to open their mouth and then some archaeologist turns a spade over and proves the thing that they thought was true, these critics, is wrong. God's word indeed is true. We can walk on the floor of Sargon's palace with the Arabs and again, Bible prophecy reveals itself as true and genuine and authentic. Here is a cuneiform, that means clay, tablet that tells about the birth of Sargon. But we need to travel to Lebanon because I think in Lebanon is one of the most fantastic, one of the most amazing uh, prophecies in all the Bible. Let's travel for, further north to the seaport city of Old Tyre. Tyre is a, was a fantastic city. I mean, here's a commercial city, a city of... Uh, commerce, a city of art, a city of culture. This is in southern Lebanon, country of Lebanon today. You remember reading recently where you had the battle in Lebanon with the Hezbollah and they came with their rockets and they put them in southern Lebanon? Well, in the area of Tyre, it's one of the places they put them. And they fired these rockets into places like Tel Aviv. Well, Tyre was an amazing city back 600 years before Christ. It grew in importance until she was the mistress of the sea, the commercial center of the world. Carpets from India were brought to Tyre. Beautiful silks from China were brought to Tyre. Great artwork was brought to Tyre. And as that artwork was brought in, there was great commerce, fruits, nuts, grains were brought to Tyre. And people from all over the world came to this city of Tyre. Carthage the rival of Rome was only a colony of Tyre. Tyre was one of the best known cities of the commercial world. If you wanted to buy anything good, you went to Tyre. Tyre was a thriving city that stretched 20 miles along the shore. Ladies, you're going to identify with this. Tyre was like the Millennium Mall, but it was 20 miles long. <laughs> you got it for me? If you're not a Floridian, I'm sorry for that one, but Millennial Mall is one of the most, it's one of the it's the place, guys, it's the place where you don't want your wife to go with the credit card. <laughs> all right, all right, that's Tyre, you got it? It's the place where any, any man in the Roman world whose wife said, hey, honey, I'm heading off to Tyre, he said, oh, no, I'm broke. All right, Tyre's a tri thriving city. It stretches 20 miles along the shore. Seven miles were densely populated and built up with very, very large buildings. It's an absolutely an incredible place and in incredible city. Ships from all nations anchored in her harbor. Merchants bartered in her streets. 
It was the place to be if you were a shopper. Ezekiel 26, verse 4 says. Now this prophecy, there's five parts to this prophecy. When you read this prophecy from the logical standpoint, there's no way you can think it can be fulfilled. Look, they shall destroy the walls of Tyre, break down her towers, I'll scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. All right, she's going to be destroyed, she's going to be scraped like the top of a rock. It'll be a place for spreading nets in the midst of the sea, for I've spoken, says the Lord God. It'll become the plunder for the nations. Okay, it's going to be destroyed. It is going to be plundered. We continue. You've become a horror and shall be no more forever. It's going to be destroyed, be plundered. It would be no more forever. They will plunder your wealth and loot your merchandise. They'll break down your walls, demolish your fine houses. What else is going to happen? The Bible describes it. Throw your stones, timber, and rubble into the sea. You'll never be rebuilt, for I, the Lord, have spoken, declares the Sovereign Lord. So Tyre's going to be destroyed. Let's see if we can summarize this prophecy. Here's the summary. Nebuchadnezzar was named. He would attack the old city of Tyre. Other nations would come up against Tyre. Tyre would become bare like the top of a rock. Fishermen would spread their nets there. And then the ruins of Tyre would be thrown in the water and never be rebuilt. Now that's kind of strange. Why would you destroy a city, leave the ruins, and then come along later and throw them in the water? The fulfillment of this prophecy was precise. Shortly after Ezekiel's prediction, Nebuchadnezzar did attack Tyre, and he did destroy the city. It took 13 years, but finally, old Tyre was completely destroyed. And then... The city lay in ruins for two and a half centuries. The prophecy wasn't fulfilled for 250 years. The city was destroyed. As it was destroyed, the ruins just lay on the ground for 250 years. If I was a skeptic back then, if you were a skeptic, we're not, we're believers, but if we were a skeptic, we would say, the prophecy hasn't been fulfilled. But wait, God sees the big picture. After 250 years, Alexander the Great came along. And the prophecy was fulfilled in 333 B.C. when Alexander the Great scraped the ruins of the old Tyre to build a causeway to attack new Tyre built on an island half a mile away. So Alexander the Great comes along. He sees the ruins of old Tyre. Out a half a mile away on a little island is new Tyre. What does Alexander do? He scrapes all of the old columns in rubble off the top of the city, just like the Bible said would happen. He throws it into the water, he builds a causeway, a bridge, and goes out and gets old. From old tire, he gets new tire. The Bible has been fulfilled exactly. The Bible said multiple nations would come against tire, it did. The Bible said tire would be destroyed, it was. The Bible said it would be scraped like the top of the rock for fishermen's nets, that happened. The Bible said that the rubble would be thrown in the water, that happened. The Bible said it would never be rebuilt, and old tire has never, ever, ever been rebuilt. Ladies and gentlemen, this is no common book. The prophecies of this book have been fulfilled incredibly. Come with me now to the last point of our journey tonight, the Dead Sea. I love the Dead Sea, not because it's the Dead Sea. I mean, I love the area. I really don't like swimming in the Dead Sea very much, but I'll show you what I like about it. You know, we take groups there, and when we've gone swimming in the Dead Sea, if you don't know how to swim and you're in the Dead Sea, you float. Because the, the water content has so much mineral, you lay on your back and you can read a newspaper. It's all oily, though, and slimy. It's kind of fun for the first five minutes, but after that you feel oily and slimy. You want to hit the showers pretty quick. Um, but here's why I like the Dead Sea area. Not far from the Dead Sea, the lowest point on Earth is Qumran. And to me, Qumran is probably one of the greatest evidences of all the discoveries. I asked many famous archaeologists, I said to them, what's the, what's the most outstanding discovery that illustrates the truthfulness of the Bible? Most of them will have to put Qumran near the top. The Qumran community were a group of people called the Essenes. They lived about 150 years before Christ. These Essenes copied many manuscripts, and among the manuscripts they copied was the Bible. They copied it very precisely in a scriptorium. They hand copied the scriptures. As they hand copied them, they preserved, they hand copied Genesis, they hand copied Exodus, they hand copied Leviticus, 2,000 years ago. They hand-copied every book in the Old Testament. 
as they hand copied the scriptures, they had very, very strict copying rules. Toward the, begin, the latter part of the, uh, toward right before the beginning of the first century AD, just before Christ, the Essene community came under attack. And when it did, the Essenes were incredibly afraid that their precious manuscripts would be destroyed. So they hid them in nearby mountain caves. Those manuscripts stayed hidden for over 1,900 years. Why is it? Why is it that God would unfold and have those manuscripts discovered in our generation? Because he wants to confirm the truthfulness of his word for a society that is facing the close of human history. He wants to give you something to hold on to, something that's secure, something that's not going to shake underneath our feet. And so, the manuscripts, these precious manuscripts are hidden. One day, an Arab boy in his teens, Mohammed El Adib, was herding his flock. As he was herding his flock, one sheep got away, and he knew that daddy wouldn't be happy if he came home with one less sheep. And so he was looking for the sheep, and he came into an area of cliffs and caves. He came up from the backside, and he thought that one of his sheep might have wan wandered into the cave. So he threw a rock. He heard the breaking of pottery. As he heard the breaking of that pottery, he thought, wait a minute. Somebody's hid a treasure in that cave. There's gold coins in there, gold chalices and vessels. I better go get daddy. So the kid runs home, gets his father, and Arab dad and son go out to the cave. As, they're, as the, they go into the cave, it's dark. Their eyes dark, dark adapt, and they see clay pots. Clay pots with scrolls. And they say, wait a minute. What have we found? They have no idea of its treasure. They sell it cheaply to Arab traders. And these Arab traders bring it back to Bethlehem. The year is 1948. Now, if you know Israeli history or not, what happened in 1948? Israel became a what? State, but Jerusalem was divided. Bethlehem was given to the Arabs. Yigal Yadin, the archaeologist of Israel, heard a rumor that there were precious scrolls in Bethlehem. He crossed the barbed wire lines at the risk of his life went to Bethlehem, got the scrolls, and brought them back. For the last 60 years, scholars have been studying the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, here's the significance of those Dead Sea Scrolls. In the providence of God, they were preserved. The Dead Sea Scrolls have every book of the Old Testament in them. Now, I've had people say to me, we don't have the original Bible. We have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. What happens if you have copies of copies of copies of copies? Well, wait a minute, though. You know, have you ever played that game where one, let's say you have 21 ladies together, and one lady says one thing to the next, and then the next lady says something, and the next lady says something, and the next lady says something? How many different stories do you have after 21 ladies? 21. If you had 21 men there, how many stories do you have? 42, because every man tells a different story. I knew I had to get back in good graces of the ladies, so, you know, I just threw that one in, man. I'll tell you the truth at the end of the lecture. <laughs> you know, people say, the Bible's been copied all these times. But look, you can take the Dead Sea Scrolls 150 years after, before Christ and compare them with your Bible today. You can take the book of Isaiah, and you can take the book of Isaiah here. 2,000 years, and there is no significant difference at all. In the shrine of the book, the Dead Sea Scrolls are kept, and we see that the Bible has been accurately copied down through the ages. The Bible, indeed, is God's living word. The scrolls reveal the truthfulness of the very word of God. One archaeologist said this, Dr. Archer Gleason, there are minor omissions and additions, but the remarkable fact is that there is nothing which can be called a major addition or omission. The Christian can take the word of God in his hand and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it has not been altered, changed, or perverted. God's word indeed is inspired by God. You know, the copying, the copying techniques of these early Bible copyists were amazing. There were a group of people 700 years after Christ, 750 years after, called the Maserites. 
we found and discovered their copying techniques. Here were their copying rules. Look at these copying rules of these Maserites. Each letter had to be counted. So if they're copying like Psalm 119, they have to count every letter. They have to count every single word. They have to count up to the middle letter. They have to count up to the middle word. They're counting. They write all those calculations down. After they write those calculations down, they copy the text carefully, comparing it with the original. They check the number of letters and words. No erasures or corrections are allowed. For example, let's suppose that they're copying Psalm 119. They count the number of letters. I don't know how many there are, but let's say there are 4,000 letters. They count them. Then they count the middle letter. Let's say that's A. Then they count the words. Let's say there are 1,500 words. Then they count to the middle word. Let's say it's RAM. Then they put all those calculations down. Then after they put them down, they copy. Then they begin to read the copy and they read the original. They read down. Wait a minute. Do we have the same number of letters? Do we have the same number of words? Is the middle letter A? Oh no! I got the same word, number of words, same number of letters, but I must have transposed one because the middle letter is E. They have to rip the whole thing up and start over again. All scripture is inspired by God. God gave to us this book. These are God-inspired writings. And you and I are on a journey together, a journey of discovery. But as we go on this journey of discovery, this journey in the Word of God, the Bible says, Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God does what? Stands forever. Here is something that is reliable. Here is something that you can put your confidence in. The Word of the living God stands forever and ever and ever. But wait a minute. The Bible is not simply a book of historical facts and information. The Bible is a book that can change our lives. One night I was lecturing in a great eastern city in America, and a man came up to me after the lecture. He was a little guy, wore his suave pinstripe suit, had his black leather attaché case in his hand, and he wanted to argue with me. And he said, the Bible is not true. I'll prove it to you. I was tired. I had just had lectured, and I don't mind discussing. I don't mind answering questions, but I don't want to argue with people. He kept waving his finger in my nose. I kept backing up and backing up. He kept waving his finger. I wasn't afraid of the little guy, but I just didn't like that finger in my nose. <laughs> Standing next to me was my buddy. Now, my buddy's name was Bucky. Bucky was brought up in a dysfunctional home. His parents left, split up at an early age when he was just a boy. Bucky was filled with anger, joined the Hells Angels. His idea of a good time was to go out in the bar and drink beer and break the beer bottle after it was done and go stick somebody in the face. He went beer hopping, bar hopping, and drinking every Saturday night. But he and his motorcycle gang came to the meetings. They came in with their long hair and their motorcycle jackets, parked the motorcycles out, and we opened our meetings. We said, come, whoever wants to come, you come. Doesn't make any difference how you dress, doesn't make any difference what you look like, you just come. And Bucky came, and there was a longing in his heart and an emptiness in his soul, and he accepted Jesus Christ in the meetings. He became so filled with joy and happiness. And so he was standing next to me that night. We had been talking, and you know, when Bucky came up to me, Bucky would often put his arms around me and give me a big squeeze and say, how you doing, Pastor? Crack, crack, crack. I said, I was doing pretty good until you squeezed me that hard, Bucky. <laughs> well, that night, Bucky was standing next to me. We had been talking about something. I forget now. And this little guy kept waving his finger in my face. And I know I shouldn't have done it, but I was kind of tired. And so I just looked at Bucky. I said, Bucky, I'm too tired to deal with this guy. Would you take care of him for me? <laughs> this actually happened. Bucky looks down at the guy. And this is what Bucky said. The guy's arguing, is the Bible true and all this stuff? Bucky looks down at him and said, look, mister, you better be thankful the Bible's true. Because if it wasn't, and I was living my old life, and you talked to my friend like that, I'd take you out to some back alley. But since the Bible is true, all I'm going to do is give you a big bear hug. And he hugs the guy. <laughs> you know, that's what the Bible's all about. It's not something that fills our head. As you come night after night, Jesus Christ is going to change your life. He's going to lead you deeper to him. You'll find his word filled with hope and security, and you'll be able to say, I know in whom I've believed. And I'm persuaded 
that in the crisis of life, in the heartache of life, in the disappointment of life, in the trauma of life, He's there. He's there for you. The Christ of the Word is there for you. Listen as Jennifer Sandy sing, I know in whom I've believed. pray together tonight. Tonight as we pray, deep within your heart do you sense that there's something you can hold on to, something you can be secure about, that God's Word indeed is a guide for the past, present, and the future. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I want to thank you tonight for Jesus. Thank you for your Word. Thank you for the security, for the hope, for the confidence that we have in the living Word of God. Thank you that your Word is a guide to our lives. Guide us through this journey of faith as we follow your Word in Christ's name. Amen. 
Now let me tell you about tomorrow night before you go home. Wherever you are tonight, be sure to ask your host for a copy of the lecture.